recording that. So here we are on the 26th of May, running a little bit late, and that's my fault. I apologize. I was out getting my, my, my summer tires installed. Well, everything's a bit iffy these days. You could go out and it could take 10 minutes and you could go out and take 10 hours. It depends had, on what kind of day everybody's There was a bit, of a, a bit of a delay there. It's not worth getting into the details, but not one person, aside from my spouse, who was there too for her car, was wearing a mask. Nobody in the, uh, in the business. None of the customers came. Of course, as soon as they saw me wearing a mask, they, they kind of back off. It's a weird, <laughs> just wear your damn mask. What's wrong with you? Our dentist has arrived. No, I, for fear of the two of us sounding like a co couple of crabby old men wagging our what fingers. They call it, we call there, it Grumpod for a reason. Yeah. There are a lot of people out there just not wearing their, and they're right there, right here on yep. you. And yep. you step back and they, yep. they step forward again, or you yep. get a dirty look. Come on, folks. Don't you... Don't you check out what the premier or the mayor but, or but somebody, the, your but doctor did, has said? They did let me use the bathroom, though. So that's, that's, um, I was pleased oh, well, that's, with that. That's, thank you yeah. for them for that. Encore la toilette, monsieur, you know. Yeah, no lock in the door, right? Just, that's been blown Encore off. une fois, là, lavez-vous les mains, because I'm, you know. Prostates and COVIDs uh, don't don't communicate. Well, when you get nervous, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not nervous. I got to go to the bathroom. Yes, yeah. right. it's uh, you're sitting there. Of course, what is what's the old? What was it on Two and a Half Men? Uh, I forget who it was. He says, even while I'm going to the bathroom, I have to go to the bathroom. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually laughed and cried when I heard that. I thought, or I'm not alone. Yeah, it's true. Oh my. Anyway, uh, it's and there's there's perhaps 40% of the regular traffic on, uh, on the commercial uh, uh, yeah, streets Yeah, and here. again, I think it depends on the day because I've been out and it's been surprisingly busy. I mean, we're not talking stop and go uh, the way it used to be uh, in so many places, but there are a lot of folks out there. Anyway, folks, and again, I'm, I'm looking around and I did not see one pedestrian or one person coming out of a, I don't know, a, a grocery store or supermarket wearing a mask. So anyway, I wear my mask when I go out, out of, out of respect. Well, the thing so is with the mask is it's, it's to help the person you're encountering. If they're yeah. not wearing a mask, I'm get yeah. That's right. That's and, the uh, point. And a study published just this week, they say that even the most basic of masks, of the most basic of face coverings will reduce the travel of anything that may be ejected by 90%. It doesn't matter what, as long as you have something in front of your mush, it'll yeah. stop, you know, the And I, sa I said to myself the first time I started it, I, I feel a little silly uh, wearing this, but then what's the alternative? That's right. a little, yeah. But then you see, every, there are a number of people who are out there. Yeah, I just wear the, uh, masks, so. I wear the, uh, they're not expensive. I just wear the basic, uh, but the little wire at the top. Yeah. They're the basic. And those are the ones you can wear for three or four hours. And then, and then you, you have to get the, rid of them. But anyway, all right. Okay. Well, we have a, a rather uh, serious subject this morning. Um, an author whom you, did you interview him before? Have you spoken with no, him? No, I have not oh. interviewed David. I, I, I found the book, uh, um, it's a bit of an involved story, but uh, I was mentioning something about the Second World War and David O'Keefe, who was a historian, it was a picture of my dad. It was on VE Day. And I put up a picture of my dad uh, uh, in the uh, officer's quarters uh, on HMCS Shawinigan. That's right, he was in dad the Navy. He was a gunnery officer. Right. And David showed great interest uh, because he is a war historian, so he chimed in, and then I found out about this book he's written, and one thing led to another, and he joins us this morning. Okay, let me just bring him in here. David O'Keefe, author of Seven Days in Hell. Uh, I was reading quickly, and there's David. Good morning, David. You're, you're sideways there, pal. How are you, David? I'm sideways. Yes. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. I wonder... yeah. Okay, let's That's try that. Oh, there we good. go. Oh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I was needing there gravel go. there. For oh, that's it. Okay. That's good. That's good. working. That's working. Okay, good. Perfect. Great. Thank you for joining us, David. We were just uh, chatting about your book. We've been talking about it for a few days, actually, because it's, it's fascinating. And David is more of a student of this period and of the Second World War than I am. But man... Uh, what a painful chapter 
Um, I guess I'm, I'm going to jump right in here and ask you the question, why would you jump into this? Why, what interested you? You were, you, were, you were in the military yourself, were you not? Yeah, it was. As a matter of fact, about 20, oh God, almost 30 years ago, I served with the Black Watch here in Montreal. And that's actually how this whole thing began. When I was a young officer and I walked in, they were still some of the survivors from the Second World War, veterans from the Second World War and survivors from the Varia Ridge battle um, that were still, you know, coming to the armory on a regular basis. They would have been in their 70s at this time. And um, it was fascinating to sit down with them. And uh, of course, like most veterans, you know, at first they were a bit hesitant about talking. And then every once in a while you'd hear, you know, the occasional story. And then eventually I developed a friendship with them, um, a professional friendship, of course. And uh, then I started asking them about the specific Battle of Verrier. And it was incredible because that's when they started opening up. And it was right around the time when the McKenna brothers had just put out Valor and the Horror. So there was a lot of discussion about uh, not only Canada and the Second World War, but also the Battle of Area Ridge, which was one of their episodes. So the floodgates kind of opened at that particular point. And it was an incredible story. Um, when you have a regiment like the Black Watch from Montreal that on July 25th make an attack up Varia Ridge in Normandy, and suffer 94% casualties, you know that there's a story to be told from those survivors. It's, Can you uh, set the stage for us, David? Because I think so many Canadians, uh, to our discredit, at least of this generation, I know there was a hell of a lot of controversy right after the war about what happened and why it happened. But uh, most people think that after the Canadians hit Juno and off we went, it was off to Paris, you know, uh, yeah. on, a, on a carrier. And Verrier Ridge obviously denies that in a brutal, brutal way. Why were the Canadians given this job? If you can set the story up sure. geographically and, and uh, maybe chronologically. Well, I think you put it very well. Um, a lot of times we think that Normandy was won on June 6th. In other words, it was fantastic, you know, show on Juno Beach. And after that, the war was essentially over, but it wasn't. As a matter of fact, that was day one of a bloody 90 day campaign in Normandy, which rivaled anything that you saw in World War I. When you talk about the casualties of Passchendaele and the Somme and at Vimy Ridge, that's the same type of fighting that you would have in Normandy and particularly around the Varia Ridge area. So when the Black Watch arrive uh, a month to a day after D-Day, the um, Battle of Normandy has not gone according to plan, or at least according to what the Allies had hoped. The Germans were a bit more skillful in roping them off. So as a result, you're in a stalemate situation in early July of 1944. And basically, both armies are locked in an attritional struggle, trying to grind down each other's armies to hopefully break open and bring about a decision in Normandy. Well, when the Black Watch arrive as part of 2nd Canadian Division, they're thrust into this charnel house. Um, you know, this is a unit that's been training for five years, one in Canada, four in England. Um, they have a storied reputation and they're dying to get into battle, um, no pun intended, and um, they're thrust into this. And this is where we find ourselves and the Canadian Army in late, uh, early July of 1944, moving into the very Ridge period. But the Germans, uh, a lot of them well-seasoned in real war, right, from the Eastern Front, and a lot of them actually press-ganged. Uh, Ivan, a lot of these guys were Polish, and the, the mm. Canadians found out they didn't speak German all that well. They weren't all Germans, but they were crack troops run by the SS, well-armed with the best tanks and the best machine guns in the world against relative newcomers in these young Canadians. Well-trained. Canadian soldiers were mm. well-trained, but they hadn't fought a war yet. And the Germans also started thickening up their defenses of this so-called Verrier Ridge, which is really the end of a wheat field, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a very slow rising ridge that runs south of Caen, which is the capital of Normandy. And right from the beginning, uh, the Allies knew that this was going to be a tough nut to crack if the Germans decided that they were going to set up shop on Verrier. As a matter of fact, in the original D-Day planning, it was quite ambitious. They were hoping to get Verrier in their hands in the first two days. And that way they'd be able to use Verrier against the Germans that were trying to counterattack. 
But of course, as you know, um, they never got there, or at least they didn't get there until late July. They were hoping to get there June 6th, 7th, and 8th, and they only arrived there in July. So by this time, the Germans had a chance over the previous 10 to 12 days to start to reinforce the ridge. And as you mentioned, you have a mixture uh, of highly skilled German units. Um, some of them are Ostfront soldiers, men who were impressed from service, Sudeten Germans and Poles and Russians and Latvians and Lithuanians. But they were backed up by Panzer battle groups from um, the SS Panzer units and some of the other veteran Panzer units that had fought for years on the Eastern Front. And they understood the type of terrain better than, you know, the Canadians who were there who were green. And it doesn't yeah. matter how well trained you are, you're still green to combat until you've seen it for a while. One and of the were just, I mean, talk about like World War I, they were just, because, uh, you know, uh, timetables weren't met and things like that, you had a bunch of infantry walking in a field straight at them, much like World War I. And they were, they were uh, cannon fodder. They were fodder. Well, basically, you're, you know, military operations are dictated by the terrain. And there's no escaping the type of terrain at that point. You can't get around it. You can't go over it. You have to go through it. And so as a result, the, um, as you can see, we have yeah, never mind. We, we, we love that's, the extraneous that's, noise. Yeah, yeah, that's my box door popping. So there you go. Come here. <laughs> so there we go. Um, yeah, so it's dictated by the terrain. And the terrain, of course, in there is, is relatively flat, slow rising ridges covered in wheat and very similar to what you would find on the uh, on the Eastern Front, which made it extremely uh, advantageous for the Germans and incredibly deadly for the Allies, because you still have to cross that type of terrain to reach your objectives. And the only thing you can rely on is your artillery, your air power and your tank support to be able to either pin your opponent down or at least blind him until you can close with him and kill him. Remind us again, David, how many went into battle and how many survived? Well, for the Black Watch itself, I mean, if, if you're talking about the Battle of Barriere and particularly Operation Spring, you're talking about uh, close to 80,000 men going in. But on this particular day with the Black Watch, who have sat in that area in this incredible battle that's been going on for six days by this point. By the time they make their assault of Barrier Ridge, there's only about 325 out of about 700 left. Um, it's been an incredible a drain on them for the set, uh, six days leading up. So about 320 from what we can count make the assault in the morning. And uh, by the time the afternoon is out, only 20 of them can report fit for duty. It sounds as if it's a disaster uh, on the scale of uh, Dieppe. It is very much. As a matter of fact, uh, behind Dieppe, this is the single bloodiest day for the Canadian Army in the Second World War. As a matter of fact, the Black Watch weren't the only ones to suffer. You have units right across Canada from the Calgary Highlanders, Royal Regiment. You have the Royal Highland uh, Light Infantry from Hamilton. And by the end of the day, you have about 600 dead Canadians and about another 1,500 to 2,000 casualties. It was a bloodbath, without yeah. a doubt. Uh, the, the, the Maisies, as they call them, were part of it too, right? The Régiment Maisonneuf? Yeah, there were a couple of Montreal regiments. There was the Fusilier Mont Royal, which was in the 6th Brigade. And then you have, of course, the, uh, the Regiment de Maisonneuf, which was in the 50th Brigade with the Black Watch and the Calgary Highlanders. It was... Um, truly representative of Canada. You have units from right across the country that are taking part in this. I mean, in many cases, Verrier is Canada's Vimy of World War II, and there's but no the doubt. Vimy, the Canadians actually, I mean, it was ultimately under British commands, but the Canadians mm -hmm. used warfare tactics that were new, it seemed, at Vimy and was successful. I mean, you were still trying to go uphill. Yeah. This, this thing was a complete disaster from the beginning. And I gather Guy Simons is the guy who's blamed. Should it have been even tried? That was my next question. You, you were, well, at least one reviewer was saying you're highly critical of the commanding officer. 
Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm critical of the command structure and the atmosphere of command, not to mention the plan. Lieutenant General Guy Simmons is considered to be one of Canada's best World War II generals, um, although some people have argued that that is, you know, that Montgomery certainly felt he was the best of a bad lot. And so as a result, some people have said that, well, you know, it's damning him with faint praise. Uh, and perhaps so. Um, you know, certainly Guy Simmons it was a gunner. He was an artillery officer. He was trained that way. He was trained to think about timetables. He was trained to think about, you know, uh, uh, the, the artillery plan as dictating the pace of operations. So as a result, his plan that was created on July 25th or for July 25th was very much uh, part of his ethos. And that, right, I would argue, and I do argue in the book, that that's the downfall of it right from the start. The idea that he was wed to the idea of war by timetable. Yeah, that it was everybody too damn complicated, wasn't it, David? It was too damn it was, complicated. Without a doubt, it was probably the most complex and complicated plan that any Canadian had come up with in years, uh, without a doubt. I mean, I don't think you would see the same sort of complexity um, with battles in Italy. They were learning, they learned very quickly in Italy. And that's kind of funny because Simmons served there as well. And he should have known better. Um, but yeah, everything was relying on phase lines. There were three phase lines and you had to get to one by this particular time. And if you didn't, then everything was going to go off the rails. So right from the start, there is a flaw in your plan. And then, of course, the fact that the Germans are thickening up Verrier Ridge every single day now starts to make the British high command, and Canadians are fighting under British high command at this time, start to rethink the possibility of breaking out through this area. And they realize it is going to be a tough fight. And so as a result, General Dempsey, who is the second army commander who Simmons Corps is fighting under, he puts a caveat saying that, look, if you, know, you haven't progressed and captured your objectives by noon on the 25th, we're just gonna shut this down because we understand how difficult this is going to be, particularly for green troops that are making this attack. Simmons um, didn't really understand, I don't think, or was interested in taking that for what it meant. In other words, don't push them too hard. This is really their first big battle they're going into. He sort of took it the other way. In other words, this is his challenge. He needs to finish this no matter what the cost is by noon on the 25th. And there's plenty was of evidence. Was it hubris then, David? Was it hubris? Was it his own ego? Yeah, I think a lot of it was. And I hate to say that because I do have an admiration for Guy Simmons. But, you know, the evidence points to that, that this was his first coming out party, if you will, uh, as a corps commander. He'd been a very successful division commander in Sicily and Italy, and now he was given the reins of a Canadian corps. And there's no doubt about it, in my mind, that when he was trying to get Verrier Ridge, he had Vimy in the back of his mind. In other words, what Vimy did for the Canadian Corps and Curry later on, this is, I, I think, what was in the back of his mind. There Unless are many... we think these guys were bad soldiers, uh, the resourcefulness of the Canadians with overwhelming uh, lack of, of, uh, of equipment and stuff, the survival of some of these guys are really amazing story. These were damn good soldiers, which makes it even more aggravating. They were. I mean, these were guys who had, when I say they had trained for many years in England, you have to remember that, for instance, a lot of these units who went into battle with Canadians in World War II were legacies. Um, you know, particularly the Black Watch, most of the men who were the officers and the NCOs and some of the men in the ranks their fathers, their brothers, their older cousins had all served in World War I. And so as a result, they understood, even though they weren't professional soldiers, 99% of Canadian soldiers are citizen soldiers, right? They join up during the war. Um, there was a, a spirit and an ethos that was there that um, I would argue lent them to become soldiers very quickly. And they were able to learn quite quickly, even at the, you know, particularly at the sharp end. And I deal with that in the book. Even when the Black Watch arrived, they're put behind the lines, well, right up on the lines, for a period of time, what they call inoculation. And the idea is to sort of shake everything out, get used to what the battlefield is like. But then again, you know, it doesn't matter how, you know, how smart you are. 
uh, particularly as an infantryman, there's a billion little things that you will learn on the job that no amount of training will ever account for. And the key is to be able to really learn well them. The book. Yeah, you really spell the, that out in the, in the book. There are there are a hundred little stories here, and most mm -hmm. of it is of poor guys sitting in what they call slit trenches, right? Yeah. And just taking a pounding. Yeah. From machine gun, tanks, and artillery. They couldn't move. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to realize that, you know, it was one thing to come in and be inoculated slowly into a combat situation. But after about 12 days, they were thrown into this maelstrom. And where, you know, for six straight days leading up to the attack on Verrier Ridge, they had very limited food. They didn't have a hot meal. They had no rum to steady their nerves because the rum was cut off because there were fears of drunkenness and panic. And you can imagine what it was like to be under constant rocket, artillery, shell fire uh, from two SS Panzer Corps that were in the area, plus fending off German probes, German snipers, and then you have to go out at night and carry out patrols. It is, um, it, it is a rude awakening to what life in the front lines would be without a doubt. Now, if you take a step back, there are mm -hmm. many serious students of, of this period of history and the war, mm -hmm. David being one of them. Have you had any blowback as a result of your analysis of things and perhaps your critique of the commanding officer and other things? Are people disputing perhaps some of the things you may have put in the book? At the moment, I haven't seen that, and I think it's probably because my conclusions here were not as revolutionary, perhaps, as my conclusions about Dieppe a few years back. Um, a lot of what comes out, and I always follow the evidence. Whichever way the evidence takes me, that's the way it takes me. But there are other historians who have covered this ground before, so I am not, um, even though I am very um, straightforward in my criticism of, of Simmons and his plan, um, this is not revolutionary. As a matter of fact, there's there's plenty of historiography out there about the you know strengths and weaknesses of Guy Simmons. Um, but where I really do take them to task is at the end of the war, as Dave mentioned earlier, uh, the idea that there was a lot of politicking going on at the end of the war when it comes to the memory of this and the understanding of what happened. And of course, at the end of the war, uh, Simmons had designs uh, on the uh, uh, chief of the general staff. He wanted to be the first post-war right. CDS. Right. And so as a result, he engaged in a healthy or an unhealthy massaging of history by putting pressure on the official historian. So that's really where I guess I could say I find it. Um, I find it to be an extreme example of cowardice to, to throw your subordinates under the bus when they have carried out faithfully the orders and the plans that you have put into effect. Yeah. And including to be honest, over the bodies of all the men who died that th those those terrible days in July. Yeah. And, you know, as much as I would like to say that this is a one off for Simmons, there is evidence from his previous battles in Italy and in Sic Sicily and the rest of Italy that he would do this. This was something that was part of his um, I had to say this, sad to say part of his playbook. He would blame subordinates for what otherwise would be false in his plans. And I can certainly understand it from a clinical perspective, pointing out things that did go wrong, but that's not the case here. This was done specifically to distance himself. A quick thing, David, which is mentioned, the even greater tragedy is there are neighborhoods in Montreal where all the sons, mm. the brothers, there are just neighborhoods where somebody knows somebody gone. Because the, yeah. the, the, the Black Watch then was pretty much a Montreal group, right? Primarily. Well, yeah. I mean, the Black Watch is a Montreal unit. It always has been, always will be. And, you know, during the sec First World War, it was, I would say, probably about 90% were Montreal. By the time they go into battle uh, in Normandy, it's about 75% because there are a lot of Americans and Eastern Europeans and Brits who come over and want to join the Black Watch. But the vast majority of the the kids, and I say the kids because most of them were between, you know, 17 and 24. Um, they came from the English working class areas. They came from Griffintown. They came from Verdun. They came from the Point, Rosemount, NDG. And so you can imagine when 300 of them disappear over that ridge on July 25th, you can imagine what it's like at home when suddenly all those bicycle couriers are coming up to everybody's home bringing that dreaded telegraph. 
yeah. you know, Minister of National Defense regrets to inform you. And then the waiting begins because nobody knew for weeks what had happened. What, what happened to the reputation of the Black Watch immediately after that with, with say, the other allied troops? They think, yeah, the Canadians just can't do it. Or the other side of it, give the Canadians the shit jobs. Well, in some cases, that was kind of legacy from World War I. Uh, by the end of World War I, the Canadian Corps was known as the shock troops of the British Empire, um, partly because everybody else had bled themselves white, and the Canadians were the ones who adapted pretty quickly. And also, too, we were, we were dutiful. Um, you know, we would go out and we would take on the hard jobs and we would do it willingly. Part of it was our own pride, our own nationalistic pride. And you certainly see that uh, in World War II as well. I mean, there was no doubt about it. Uh, you know, one thing I've noticed, uh, I, I have never noticed any criticism specifically along the lines of nationalism in the Barrier Bout. Um, Canadians were more than willing to be there. They were more than willing to take their place. They were critical of their commander, but their commander could have been anyone and they would have been critical of them. It didn't matter whether he was Canadian, whether it was a British Army commander or an Army group commander, it really didn't matter. So Montgomery comes up for a lot of blame too. It was his overall, and Mont Monty uh, came under, you know, he was trying to re recreate El Alamein and it, it yeah. just, not going to happen. Wow. Yeah, are. there's a lot of criticism that goes around on all levels, and particularly the creation of the culture of command, which is a tremendous weakness, um, particularly in Simmons' core. Simmons was an autocrat. Uh, uh, you know, he was, uh, or I should say, not an autocrat, but a, a micro, well, he was a micromanager. And so as a result, there was a paralysis. His subordinate commanders did not feel they had freedom of action, let alone the confidence to do what they knew on the spot was the right thing to do at the time. They couldn't use their professional judgment. They couldn't use their intuition. They couldn't go with their gut feelings because there was always a price to pay with the boss upstairs. David, thank you very much for your time. I wish we could yeah. talk about this I, for another I, I, hour and a half. Quickly, why don't Yvonne, I, why don't more Canadians know about this? Guy? I'm, I'm appalled at my ignorance about this story, David. Well, I was well, too, to tell you the truth. Well, I think it gets back to what I talked about earlier. Um, you know, the Battle of Verrier Ridge took three massive attempts before we actually wrestled it from the Germans. Vimy, the story, the narrative is different. The British tried it, the French tried it, the Canadians came in, and on the first try, we took it. Well, in this particular case, the Canadians tried it on the 18th, along with the British, and it was bloody. They tried it again on the 25th. It was another disaster. And then finally, on the August 8th, they were able to take it. So as a result, it was not considered to be as clean of a victory. And also, to the events on July 25th, the second attempt to take Verrier, the one that I talk about in depth in the book, was highly controversial. Not only did you have the massacre of one of Canada's most storied regiments with political connections, but you also had mutiny at the other end of the ridge with one of the two of the veteran units from the 3rd Canadian Division that hit Juneau Beach. So from a high command perspective, they saw it as a very ugly chapter. And what I alluded to before was the fact that at the end of the war, Simmons didn't want to be reminded of this. And so as a result, he put a lot of pressure on the official historians to not so much cover it up, but just dampen it down quite a bit. Take the sting out of it as much as possible and deflect. So to get back to what Ivan was mentioning, that's likely one of the reasons why we don't hear about Verrier when we actually should. Yeah, David O'Keefe. there's no glory there. Seven, seven days in hell. David, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thanks, well, thanks gentlemen. Peter. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Bye now. Bye-bye. Say bye hi to the dog. I will. Poppy <laughs> says goodbye. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, my. Sorry, I took so much time. But no, 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 no. Uh, you know more about this, and, and uh, unfortunately, we're having trouble with your microphone again this morning. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about the, uh, the connection, the actual wire itself? It may be. Anyway, let us... Uh, Take an, a last look at the book cover here, and then we'll do some troubleshooting after that. We're supposed to okay. uh, chat the, with the, uh, There were probably only about three or four guys who yeah, came out. Look of at this. Line. Look at this, right? Yeah. Guys. And the from... older veterans, as, as David alluded to, some of the officers were 30 years younger than we were. We are. It's, it's, uh, it's quite something.
Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for introducing me to the story and to David O'Keefe, because that's, well, uh, quite that's a read. something I'm going to follow up on. All right. We, tomorrow, uh, we'll be chatting with Terry DeMonte. I'm trying to track him down here this morning. Okay. That'd be and great. And we will confirm that. Uh, so have a good day. And we'll All right. Are you, having the, uh, are you having the snow plow put on the band today, too? Uh, yeah. I might as well make my appointment for the, for the fall and just go back in yeah. a couple of weeks. <laughs> Did you have to make it quite a while ago to get the I tires think, changed? In March, I think, or uh, April, something like that. That's yeah. surprising. Yeah.